Close your eyes. Take a deep breath in through the nose. Release it with a ha. <sighs> deep breath in. I am love. A drop from the eternal ocean. I come from love. I return to love. Deep breath in. I am love. Now just sit quietly and take these words in. My drop of love catches a ride on a spark of light. I come to experience, to create in this playground of God. The light, my container, a powerful tool, a body with thought and feeling, allows me Earth's precious experience. My drop resides in the center of light, with my heart the only true teacher. I am love, riding the light until it fades. Lost in the trappings of the mind, attached to the illusions of experience, I sometimes forget I am love's perfection. But when I leave this experience of riding the light, I return to love's embrace, to remember I have always been love. Deep breath in. I release the illusion of imperfection, for I am love, say it, I am love. I come from love, I come from love. I return to love, I return to love. Deep breath in, I am love, I am love. I know it's a little rushed with the restaurant. I appreciate you being here. Some of you not getting a chance to eat even, and some of you, some people not even going to get a chance to come because they're still over in the restaurant. First of all, I want to thank Faye so much for being able to move all of these gongs over here just so we could have this experience of a little bit of music before we were starting tonight. So thank you for doing that. Also, I want to start sending this around if anybody wants to be on my email list I'm begging you to print your name I don't send out a lot of emails but I do send um, some of the events that are coming up but also like insights that I'm getting if I get spirit messages and that I'll put those on here also so if we can pass down around and then all the way back I really appreciate that <sighs> So I have a story to tell, and you are the first group I get to tell it to as far as at a conference or anything like that. It has been a very interesting journey, and I want us to just have a nice casual evening tonight. I want us to be able to relax. I want you to be able to ask questions. I will repeat the questions. Um, is this going to be videoed for the um, for sale on the conference? I am video. We really weren't set up for it. We didn't know one way or the other. Oh, okay. All right. So you guys, you are, you're it. <laughs> All right. So you're going to have to share the story then when people ask. So in uh, January of this year, I happened to receive an email from a friend of mine from California. It's a Taiwanese couple in California. And it just so happens. Yeah, come on in. I just am starting the story here. And it just so happens that I had not heard from them for quite some time. I had heard from Wayne and Judy Lynn, who I call Mindrel, that's her spiritual name. I had heard from Wayne and Judy Lynn um, five years previous to this because Judy's daughter was a motorcycle rider, had fallen off a 20-foot cliff onto her head and shoulder and was in ICU in California. 
I immediately got on an airplane and I went to California and I worked in ICU on her for 24 hours and Judy who was also a healer we would work on the phone for at least an hour every morning by the time this girl got out of the hospital they said she was a miracle and I said are you a kidding we worked our asses off on this girl <laughs> Like, we were seriously doing serious heavy-duty mojo healing work, and the medical people were doing their serious medical stuff, but this girl would not have survived without the healing work, flat out would not have survived. And she came out of it, again, as a miracle, 99% whole and healthy. The only 1% is that she is missing her memories from a few days before, until after she kind of woke up from her chemical induced uh, coma just and she doesn't remember anything negative about people that she forgot about she only remembers the positive things so nothing negative so not a bad thing to lose <laughs> so I have a really close connection with Wayne and Judy I had met them when I was teaching in Boulder Colorado and Gisela Hoffman who actually happens to be here I was teaching at Peaceful Meadow Retreat and Gisela um, was liking what I was doing and so invited me to come back that summer a month later and she said if you can come back early that would be great because I have a training class that I'm doing and you can do private sessions for people and you can do your rainbow sun qigong because we're doing it every morning before we start anyway we're just putting the DVD in so you can just be there and do it and they can get a chance to know your work and know who you are well Judy and Wayne happened to be there that week and that's how I met them and from that point on they started bringing me to California to work um, and do some teaching with the people in California the Taiwanese group over there they had brought so many people over there teaching them techniques and all of that that they finally said don't don't bring us any more people with technique bring Ellie she gives us teaching and that's how they that's how they say it and and Judy's Wayne's brother Judy's brother-in-law he would always ask me at the end of teaching, he'd say, are you a reincarnated Rinpoche? And I'd say, why do you keep asking me? You know, I don't even know what that is. Why do you keep asking me that? And he said, well, we're Buddhists, and you're teaching us Buddhist teaching. However, you're telling us, you're explaining to us why to do the practices that we're told to do. We're told to do the forgiveness work, but we're not told why. You're teaching us the importance and why and and like for those of you how many of you went to my talk this morning a lot of you went so the story of Murray that I had on there you know I'm able to share those kind of things that happen karmically for a person and how you get these energy ties the importance of doing the forgiveness work and so he said you're giving us Buddhist teaching but you've never been trained in Buddhism you don't even know the words that we're using and yet you are giving us these teachings and our practices are more meaningful as a result of you being here teaching and so he said, where do you get your information? I said, I just sit and meditate and ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and I sit and I wait for answers. And the answers come to me. And so that's how I've always gotten my information. So the information isn't filtered through somebody's interpretation of somebody else's interpretation of somebody else's interpretation. It's just direct knowledge, direct information. So it's very um, clean. The information's clean. So anyway, this is some of my history with uh, Judy Lynn and Wayne. Well, I hadn't heard from them for about five years, I mean, just off and on, but for about five years, because the weekend that I was there working with her daughter for 24 hours in ICU in California was also the weekend that Judy Lynn found out she had breast cancer, had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And at that time, they decided to close their education center that they had move the business back into the home and Judy and Wayne started a pilgrimage of all different ways of doing alternative healing anything that they could figure out uh, until she did end up doing chemotherapy she did end up doing um, breast work uh, mast mastectomy mas mastectomy am I saying it right okay uh, all of that and yet she she was still not doing well so anyway, I, like I said, I didn't hear from them until the day before, what's the coincidences of this in five years? The day before I am flying to California to LAX, 
because I work with some scientists in California. There's actually scientists who like working with a psychic to get them information and clarity, and it's been very beneficial for them. We've been working more than a year uh, together now. So <clears throat> I get an email from Wayne. Mindral is in home hospice. She would like to talk to you. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about the Chinese or Taiwanese culture, they are the most private people you will ever meet. They don't tell anybody anything. I can tell you that most of her family members probably never even knew she had cancer. I can tell you that after they made the announcement, after she passed, that some of her best and closest friends didn't even know she had cancer, didn't even know she had crossed, passed away. That's how private they are. For them to reach out to me at all is a huge, huge thing. And yet, Judy Lynn reached out to me. Wayne sent me an email and said, Judy would like to, to talk with you. She's in home hospice. Well, it just so happens I'm flying out 8 o'clock tomorrow morning to work with my scientists. Send me a car, and I'll, I'll go to your house. So they picked me up. I let my scientists know I wouldn't be in until late that night. They picked, uh, Wayne picked me up, had me brought to the house. And I didn't know if I was going to stay with Judy that night or after I got done working with my scientists, if I would stay, you know, come and stay longer. I didn't know. If it felt like we were complete this first time, it would feel like we were complete. So here's a beautiful woman laying in bed. She's, you know, under 100 pounds. I actually have a picture of us here. Let me go over to it. Her daughter, Sammy, that I was telling you about, took this picture of us all laying in this huge king-size bed. This is her daughter, Sammy, down on the bottom right. Let me get out of your way so you guys can see. And uh, she just looks so beautiful there, doesn't she? And she was asking questions that were really fascinating to me when they're on their deathbed. This was a woman that spent her life, her passion, with her spirituality. It was so important to her. She was a Tibetan Buddhist. She had the most gorgeous altar you have ever seen. She knew six of the top Tibetan Rinpoches personally, had studied with them personally, had given them huge donations personally. I mean, this was a woman who was committed to her spirituality. What I found out about Buddhism, because I grew up as a Christian, and now I'm a metaphysician, so, you know, but I don't know that much about Buddhism, but I found out something very interesting, and it's that they have a belief and for those of you who are Buddhists, you know, I may be getting this wrong, but I can only tell you what my interpretation of it is from my own experience, that there's something called enlightenment that they're trying to attain. And I keep wanting to write an article on the illusion of enlightenment <laughs> because I go, well, what does enlightenment mean to you? And this enlightenment piece, for me, it felt like it's almost, it's almost like putting on somebody to be guilty for living your life here because you're not enlightened, and if you were enlightened, you wouldn't be back here again. See? And at the same time, they do this bodhisattva prayer. And the bodhisattva prayer is that you're, you're making a vow to, to come back for every lifetime until all sentient beings are enlightened. So there's a little bit of a conflict here. <laughs> it's like, okay, there is a problem here. As she's laying on her deathbed, she's asking me questions. Now, Ellie, have I done everything that I can do? Have I done everything? And I, I took my way of the lotus flower practice, and, and uh, she couldn't breathe deep or anything, and I was doing the three forgivenesses with her. Just read, you know, she's so fragile, and I was just reading it to her really quietly. And I was doing the releasing vows statements and the calling all aspects of herself back statements. And then I would repeat it again. And... Three times I would repeat it, and she would just sink in deeper and sink in deeper and sink in deeper and come to more peace and more peace and more peace. She was in so much pain that um, they were giving her morphine. And morphine had terrible side effects for her. And someone said, 
try medical marijuana. It doesn't have the, medical, the, the side effects on it. And I don't know anything about marijuana, but what I can tell you is it was the most beautiful experience to see her have no side effects, to be able to do her puff on those electronic cigarette kind of things that they do, and to have instant pain relief. To be able, they have been able to isolate the chemicals in it so that you can have the sleepy, kind of dopey kind of feeling, or just the pain relief kind of part of it. And so, you know, she really wanted to have a conscious death, and so she was always wanting to just have the pain relief part of it. And I'd say, honey, you need to sleep at night. Take the dopey part too at nighttime so you can get some sleep, <laughs> because she wasn't sleeping well. And I met the spirit of marijuana. That was such a beautiful thing. She was so beautiful. And she was there to truly gift humanity. It was such a surprise to me because I don't know anything about it. You know, I grew up in, you know, the whole thing about no drugs kind of thing. I'm not a 60s girl. <laughs> I'm a 50s, <laughs> 50s girl. Anyway, um, but that was something that was also interesting about the process, about about just her whole experience. And so for any of you who are uh, working in hospice or that, I would not shy away from the medical marijuana. It made her journey so much easier, I cannot even tell you. So there's that piece. Um, she said, thank you for doing the Way of the Lotus Flower practice with me. She said, I, I can't keep my mind all clear. I'm in so much pain and the drugs kind of make me a little bit sleepy, even when it's just the pain relief parts of it. And she would say, I was trying to do this work, but I couldn't do it by myself. So one of the questions somebody asked in the talk today is, what if I have somebody in home hospice? What if they can't, they can't say it or they can't do the breath work? They can't do it. Just read it to them really gently. Just read it to them so that they can go in their own heart space and they can release and, and do the forgiveness work, releasing vows and promises that they've made because it would, made it so peaceful for her. She would say things like, I feel guilty that I ate meat because she had some Indian um, uh, teachers also who are completely vegetarian and it's all these rules and vows about eating meat. And so she would ask me, I, I feel guilty about, about eating meat. Do I have to feel guilty about this? Do I have to like, ask the animals for forgiveness? And so I'd say, well, I don't know. I'll go ask. And I would sink in. Does anybody want to know the answer to that? No. Okay. So I would sink in, and I, and I would ask. And what I was shown is everything in these little ping, pinpricks of light. And I've seen things like this, like for two weeks I was seeing things like this, like I couldn't take a step on a sidewalk not knowing if I'm going through the light or if I'm going to actually hit a sidewalk when I was having one of my freaky two-week psychic weird things that happened to me. And so I was familiar with everything showing up as little tiny pinpricks of light. And so I'm seeing everything. I'm seeing the plants as these pinpricks of light. I'm seeing the animals as these pinpricks of light. And I'm showing that it makes no difference, that you're eating you're eating light. You're eating light. Actually, I was doing one of my lotus flower retreats one time, and I was right in the middle of sacred forgiveness. Ceremony. Maybe this is a little off topic, but not quite. Um, but I was doing sacred forgiveness ceremony, and this whole hive of fairies come in. And they're like a hive consciousness, very fast, very high vibration, very... Da -da 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 -da. Anyway, at one point they said, why, why do you... Why do, you, why do you not eat light like everyone else eats light? The trees eat light. Nature eats light. Why don't you eat light? And then this little male one kind of pushed himself through, and he goes, I tried a bug once, but it was yicky. <laughs> <laughs> and they all pushed him back out of the way, but the whole point is eating light. So <laughs> it is kind of on topic about the light, because what I was seeing is that the plants are made of light, the animals are made of light, and, and that it's... Um, uh, another thing I can tell you about that is what I always feel bad about roadkill. It's just like, it's so hard for me to see. And the ravens showed up to me one time and they said, it is not roadkill, it's offering. It's offering. Because that's what feeds them. And I've always felt so much better about it since then. It's all about perspective. 
It's all about perspective. That's right. When I got there's the perspective, it's offering. And so the same feeling I got that day working with Judy is that it's, it's like offering. The plants are offering. The animals are offering. So then she surrendered again, even deeper to that, and was at such peace. But I could still see that it, she just wasn't complete. So I knew to go work with my scientists. They, they drove me to another part of the LA area, worked with my scientists for a couple days. They sent another car, and then I went back to the house, and I did stay overnight that night. And Wayne had said that before I had come and did the Way of the Lotus Flower practice with her, that she, her moods were up and down and up and down and up and down. And after I did the practice with her, he said, she's been steady and peaceful the whole time. So again, just read it to people who are crossing over. Just read it to them. And she was so peaceful. So anyway, I spent more time uh, answering questions that she had. And um, I could still see that she just wasn't, wasn't there. And it was really bothering me that she just wasn't at peace because she had spent so much of her life just in her spirituality and s literally traveling the world to find the best teachers and, and, and to come to peace. But she was still not at peace. And I couldn't understand this because her husband was at peace. Her daughter was at peace. But Judy wasn't at peace. So that night when I went to bed, I was sitting in meditation right across from the room for her. And I talked to my people. Hey, you guys, if she doesn't have it now, when is she going to get it? Really? So I need some help here. I want my friend to die peacefully. She's not happy. She wanted to die yesterday, and you're telling me it's going to still take two weeks. She's not happy about hearing this information. I can't collapse time any more than two weeks. That's what I'm getting. Help me. What can I have to help her? And the phrases of the I am love poem start coming through. Just the one that had originally first come through, even that first day that I was working with her, is Judy, you are love. You come from love. You return to love. You are love. That was the very first one that had come through that first day, and it just was, that one was just totally solid, totally strong. And these other statements would come through. Just randomly. Your drop resides in the center of light. You come to experience and create. This is information I had gotten actually before. The one that was the most meaningful to her, lost in the trappings of the mind. It was lost in the trappings of her beliefs, see? Lost in the trappings of the mind, attached to the illusions of experience. I sometimes forget I am love's perfection. So all of these phrases all through the night were coming through. And by 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, it w they were all so noisy that I finally got my computer out. I just wrote the phrases in whatever way I happened to pick them up and hear them. And then I rearranged them so that they flowed and they went together and all of a sudden, I don't have a dinger, but it was like ding, and I knew it was complete. So I get up, I go downstairs, Wayne is up downstairs, and I said, Wayne, listen to this. This is a message that came through for Judy. So some of you have just been kind of wandering in. I want you to hear it again. Just close your eyes, take a deep breath in. I am love. A drop from the eternal ocean. I come from love. I return to love. Deep breath in. I am love. My drop of love catches a ride on a spark of light. I come to experience, to create in this playground of God. The light, my container, a powerful tool, a body with thought and feeling, allows me Earth's precious experience. My drop resides in the center of light. See, that center of light is your body. With my heart, the only true teacher, I am love riding the light until it fades. Lost in the trappings of the mind, attached to the illusions of experience, I sometimes forget I am love's perfection. But when I leave this experience of riding the light, I return to love's embrace, to remember, 
I have always been love. Deep breath in. I release the illusion of imperfection, for I am love. I come from love. I return to love. Say it with me. Deep breath in. I am love. Her husband bursts into tears that morning. Her daughter bursts into tears that morning. They went, this is so perfect for her. We knew it was a universal message. We knew this was not only for Mindro, that it was a universal message. We were all got the same message that I should record it. Well, because I'm a little bit of a tech geek and I knew enough and had enough equipment with me, I was able to record it in a very, very quiet, soft voice. And I was able to put it with music that I hear. There's these three sounds that I hear, this A-E-A -E -A music that I hear. And I've created music with that. It's called the three sounds of the lotus flower that I have. And I put that very softly in the background. And for two days after I left, they played it right beside her bed for 48 hours. And she became more and more and more peaceful. Now there's another part to this story and to this journey, which is this whole thing about her crossing over in two weeks. She didn't want to cross over in two weeks. She wanted to cross over yesterday. She was done. She was ready. She felt like she was complete. But that two weeks was really precious time, and there was a lot of completion things that started happening for her. However, I went home, and I started demanding from my peeps, my friend wants to die. There has to be a way to turn down the dial on her life force energy because it's the body that's locking her down. And she's, she's in home hospice. She's dying. There's no, there's no doubt about that. And I said, there has to be a way for us to be able to assist somebody, those of us who are healers, to be able to, to drain off that life force energy. Otherwise, I can tell you without the information I received, and it took me three and a half days to get the information, and boy, I was really pissy with my guides going, I really want this information. Show me this information. And I was really just in it, in it, in it for three and a half days. Even as I'm washing dishes, I'm, you know, my mind is inside really asking for information about how to do this. Three and a half days later, I was given the information. I am so sorry that I do not have permission to share that information with you. Talk to your people <laughs> and get direct transmission. If I'm ever guided to share it, I will share it, but it's not something that I can share. She died literally exactly two weeks after I figured out how to turn her dial down on her bodysuit. Or her body had enough life force fire energy in it that she would have probably physically lived for an additional month to six weeks. So talk about a gift that I felt like I was given to assist my friend in, in her transition to be able to do that. Every day, I was able to call Wayne. I was able to go in and say, this is what's going on with her today. This is what I'm seeing today. And about three days before she died, I said, did she cross over? And he goes, no, why do you say that? And I said, well, I don't know, but there's all these really bright beings all over in her room. Like, there's a lot of energy in there. And he goes, you know, everybody's been saying her room feels completely different. And it did feel different. Also, it turns out, that I didn't know this until after she had passed. Three days before she died, the I Am Love poem was so meaningful to her that in her little Chinese chicken scratching, laying on her bed on a pad of paper like this, she translates the I Am Love poem into Chinese. No kidding. There it is. She kept saying it's the universal teaching. I'll tell you about the one on the right in a moment. She had told her husband, the moment I take my last breath, Wayne, I want you to call. And again, we thought she would say one of her six Tibetan Rinpoches. 
One, her, her, Swamiji, her Indian master teacher that she had done 21 day, several 21 day retreat, awakening retreats with in India. No, it was to call this white woman in Arizona. I mean, it just made no sense to me. Call Ellie. Promise me. He, he said she insisted on it. Promise me the moment I take my last breath, you will call Ellie. Well, Gary and I had been looking for homes, first in, in Tucson, weren't finding what we wanted, then in Sedona, weren't finding what we were wanting, then in Flagstaff, weren't finding what we were wanting, and then into Prescott, and now we have found what we want. Okay, however, in that journey, Gary and I happened to be in Sedona, staying at the Poco Diablo Resort. Five o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call. Wayne says, 505 Ellie. <laughs> I get a phone call in the morning. I know exactly who it is. I'm grabbing my robe. I'm, I'm heading to the couch. With, and, and all I say to Wayne, you know, I don't say, oh, I'm so sorry. I, nothing that you normally say to somebody who's, whose loved one has just crossed. He said, Ellie, she has taken her last breath. Okay, got it going in. <laughs> That's literally all I said. Okay, got it going in. Bye. Put it down. Gary already had heads up that that's my partner, that I was going to be doing this. And I immediately went in and I sat in meditation. <sighs> so here is what I experienced for the next hour. Gary has been studying near-death experiences from all over the world for quite some time. And so he's always reading me really cool stories that he hears. But what, one of the things that he has told me about is that people from other parts of the world, their near-death experiences reflect their culture, just like our near-death experiences in the Western world reflect our culture. And I found that to be true when I met Judy on the other side also. She was literally there in a place waiting for me to meet her. And then she was ready to journey. And I said, you can't, she, got, she knew she couldn't move and she couldn't move because the first thing that I was seeing, for those of you who have been in my talks, those golden hooks, her mother had a huge golden hook into her. Her husband was good, her daughter was good, but they were more, we just wanna pray for her and make sure she's okay on the other side, okay? But I said, well, before you go, we need to unhook these hooks from mom, and we need to hook her directly up into source. So for me, just directly up into source, I can't tell you even what that means to me. It's just love. And so for me, it was like, let's unhook this from you and just hook her into love. You know, let's hook, unhook everybody, hook them directly into source. Instantaneously, mother and everybody, whoom, gone. And then Judy is free. Um, I can also tell you um, from the psychic medium experiences that I have had with people who have crossed over, please, oh, please, oh, please, I am begging you, do not hold on with your neediness to people who have crossed over because that is your shit. That is not their shit. That is your shit. Get over it. Let them go and let them be free because I can tell you, you really do hold them back. And I know you're grieving and yada, 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 but get over it. You know, we're love. We're here, we're in these bodysuits, we pop out and we leave. And that seems kind of harsh, but I can tell you, I see from the other side how people are being held back and I don't like what I'm seeing. So you have to go and get counseling or whatever it is that you need. Let go, let go of your loved ones. Bless them on their journey. And you do what I do with Judy's family, hook them directly into source. You go connect directly into source because then literally they are free to move on. And they can come back and visit you easier. I can tell you so often, I have people say, my mother or my loved one or whoever, whoever has not been able to talk to me. And it's because you grieve too much. Your bodysuit noise is so loud, they can't get through to you. You have to be able to come into peace. And when you come into peace and surrender, they can come close to you. They can show up in your dreams and in your meditations then. So you have to be able to come to a place of really understanding truly who we are, which are souls having a physical experience. So when you're able to let go, the other person can move on, and that's what Judy and I started doing. We started traveling. The mind is an amazing thing. 
her mind had created for her an image of what she thought it would be like on the other side. It was like I was in a navy blue landscape that was just open, but I could see mountains in the background. And she loved Tibet. She loved the, they call them over, over there, we call them the Himalayas, they call them the Himalayans. They, she loved the mountains. And all of a sudden, we're just traveling together. And then I see kind of far away, about twice as far away as the back desk back there. And I see this whole bunch of other people. And I'm a little bit higher. And I'm going, oh, that's all people who have just died too. And they're at the desk. <laughs> Almost like, what do I do? And I can tell you I've met people on the other side who don't even know that they've died. And it was Homer who started, when I've had the Homer experience, if you don't know that story, I'm not going to go into it tonight. But <laughs> Anyway, when Homer died, then I started seeing people who had crossed over. A lot of people who didn't even know what the, that they had crossed over. And, 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 I, and I would always talk to these people, and I'd go, um, just a minute, I'll be right back. And I would dial my vibration out, and I'd go, Homer, what have you gotten me into? What are you, isn't there somebody like who's supposed to be in charge of these people? <laughs> and, he, and he would always tell me, bring them through the blue light tunnel to the park on the other side. Bring them through the blue light tunnel. And every time, there was always someone who was there waiting for people. And so with Judy, again, it was all this blue, this navy blue kind of landscape with these mountains. And I see this desk, and I said, Judy, you don't need to go there. Just go to source. Go directly to source. Go to love. Instantaneously, we start traveling up. And it was almost like a huge column. And as we're traveling up, now I, I'm trying to remember as much as I can because I was in trance. So as we were traveling up, I'm seeing all of the world's religious um, iconic images that we have. It's like, oh, there's Mother Mary. And I, I love Taoism. So it's like, oh my God, there's the guy with the big bulbous head, Lao Tzu. Hi, cool. And we just kept traveling and traveling. And I'm seeing all these images that I've seen on altars of the bodhisattvas. And I don't know who they're all called as we're traveling. But they felt like they kind of watch your journey as you, as you go along. There was one place that we reached a platform. And all of a sudden, we moved off. And we were told, you have to leave your body here now. So when you first cross over, you cross over with quite a physical, dense energy body. Um, and that's why I was able to see Homer pretty clearly. And, and many people, when they first cross over, they're pretty, pretty dense energy body. Even when you do inner journey travels, at, at, there are places that you go that you can't bring that dense energy body when you even do out-of-body experience kind of things. You have to even leave that body behind and go. And that's what happened for her. And what we were told was, bless your body. Thank it for its journey, and then you have to leave. And all of a sudden, she's another essence of her is stepping out of even that part, and then we're traveling up again. There came a place where all of a sudden, you know in the near-death experiences that people talk about, that they have a life review? Well, I thought it was a life review. All of a sudden, here I am with Mindro, and bam, instantaneously, we are in 2,000 of her lives. I saw her with this big bum, bent over, handing out beer. I saw her as a warrior. I saw her as a sexy little kitten, you know, like <coughs> prostitute kind of girl, but very high class. I, I mean, just... I was astounded. It's like, what happened to just the one life? It was all of these lives. And then, boom, I see what looks like um, an old theater where it has the curved area for uh, private boxes that can watch the theater. And I see us in another lifetime. We're wearing red Tibetan robes. Now, this was interesting for me to see us with the red Tibetan robes here because when Judy and I would walk, we would go hiking together, and when we would walk, in my side vision, I was always seeing kicked up 
these red Tibetan robes when we were walking, even when we were wearing our American clothes. So I was always seeing this connection with us. So here we are on this balcony, and we're making a promise to each other. And the promise is that we would never let each other forget who we truly were. And I see us with these really big chalices, and I see us clinking them and, you know, doing the arm thing, wrapping our arms through, and we put our foreheads together, boom. And then I just started crying. And the reason I started crying is because that's when I came to the awareness that as she was laying on her deathbed, and as I was in across the room meditating, asking for something to help her, I realized that it was her higher self that sent that poem to. We had made a promise not to let each other forget who we were. And so here she is on her deathbed, her higher self, very busy and active, going, we got to get this, we got to get this through. If they're always looking, spirits are always looking to get really beautiful information through. And it was just such an amazing insight. <sighs> and then we continue to travel. And all of a sudden, we get to this place, mountainous again, but is literally as far as I can see in any direction. I'm seeing these golden, you know, the, the brass statues that you see in Buddhism and, and Tibetan Buddhism and all the, of the bodhisattvas and the, I don't know who all these people are called, like I said. But anyway, it was the, as far as I could see. But I remember that as we were coming, traveling up and getting to this place, Judy got so excited. And she was, I've made it. You know, I've made it. And I'm going, no, this is, a, this is form. Because anything that is light, anything that is form is made of light. It's not love. Because I have known from my own inner traveling that we aren't even any form. We aren't even light. That's just the bodies that we travel in. And that's what just gets formed around it. That's all light. We aren't light. So, if, so when you're traveling the inner realms, if you see form, you know you're not there. I knew I wasn't there. I knew we weren't there. But I turned around, and she had turned into one of these statues. And I said, Judy, get out of there. Get out. And I was so mad. It's like, Judy, no, this is form. We have to keep going to love. We have to keep moving. And I'm bamming on this thing. And it's like, oh, psychic Dremel tool. I need my tools. You know, I'm like just doing anything that I can to, to break this thing open. Mm -hmm. And it finally crashes open. This is how strong the mind is. It creates forms that are so strong. This is where she felt enlightenment was, see? I have made it to the land of Amitabha, or wherever uh, they go. And a Christian's heaven, you know, I've made it. And I'm going, it's form, it's form, get out of there. And it broke open, and all of a sudden she came awake and she said, what happened? She had fallen asleep in form. And I said, I just broke you out of this, this is form. We can't stay here, we must keep going. We must keep going. The Christian version of this, Bob Monroe wrote about, I think in his second or third book. He wrote about as he was doing his out-of-body experiences that he saw, he came to a place where there were rows and rows and rows of bodies laying there. And he talked to the beings of light that were there and he said, what's up with this? And he said, this is Christians waiting for the second coming of Christ. Wow. And he said, well, wake them up, you know, because they were just laying there. And he goes, we can't wake him up. They think we're the devil. Are you Jesus? Are you the second coming of Christ? And so they've put themselves asleep. That's the Christian version of this. Well, this was a Buddhist version of it that she had almost got caught into. When she got broken out of that, there was a bit of a fire in her belly going, I didn't know. I thought this is where I was supposed to go. This is where I've been thinking. I'm, I've, I've reached enlightenment if I get to this place. And I said, we must keep going. And she looked at me and she said, first, I need to go back to my family now. 
boom, instantaneously, we are back in the room where her body is. I see her mom, I see her husband, her daughter, they're all there. And she said, I need to do some more forgiveness work. And right there in that moment, we did the three forgivenesses. I forgive myself for all things real and perceived. I ask others to forgive me. And she goes, Wayne, I really ask you to forgive me. Everybody, I was always such a know-it-all with all my religious stuff, always trying to tell everybody what to do, and here I'm the one that nearly failed on this. Forgive me for being so, so bossy, trying to tell all of you what to do. And as she was doing her forgiveness work, there was a wall that was almost like sucking this gray shadow stuff right out of her spirit that level of spirit body that she was in. It was just draining all that off so she was getting clearer and clearer and clearer. The third forgiveness, I give others forgiveness. You know, for teaching me these things, I thought I was doing the right thing. Those of you who are in my talk today, remember the mind? Righteous, I'm always right, don't tell me I'm wrong. And so she was realizing, wow, I was really trying to be a good spiritual person on the planet. And then she looked, she was across the room from me, and she looked across at me, and she said, this is all just a mental construct, isn't it? I said, yeah, it is. And she, bam, she got it. And just like all of you guys, from my perspective, are all these little heads, well, it was kind of like ice, just like this, and all of a sudden, starting from where she was at, like a rolling pin, rolled across all those little thought forms and all of a sudden the room was just filled with just this beautiful feeling and all the forms just went away and she woke up into pure consciousness. She made it. It was so beautiful. And then she was fucking pissed. She was so mad. And the first thing that she did, her altar, her absolutely gorgeous, I mean, she doesn't just have brass statues, she has gold statues. She was so mad. She took her altar like this, and she has like a 12-foot altar. She took her altar, and just like somebody would clear a table, and she went wham, and she threw it all off. And she said, tell people to destroy their altars. Destroy them. And she didn't mean all this beautiful artwork and all that, because it's like gorgeous artwork, right? It's the attachment to it. She had such attachment to doing everything so perfect in her religious way. It, everything was so perfect. And here, she realized, go to love. It's so simple, and we make it so complicated. And when she threw that boy, she meant it. Go to love. And then the poem... She showed me, she said, the only thing to have on your altar is the I am love poem and say it every day so you never forget who you truly are and how simple it really is. Love, that's all it is. It is love. You are love. You come from love. You return to love. You don't have to have all your religious constructs. You don't have to have all of your beliefs. It's love. The purity of all of it was love, not your attachments to all of your beliefs. She said, if you're going to have an altar, and if you have somebody who is a loved one, put a picture of them in. And so I'll leave this up here, and I'll have it, and I've had it on my vendor's table also. And it, one of the pictures on here is one of the pictures is this of the four of us. And then it had, Sammy, when she made this, she created it where she's walking down a hallway, but she made it black and white. And on here, all she has on here is, I am love. I am love. So I'll pass this around, actually, so you can start looking at it. She showed me then how she wanted the I am love poem to be. She wanted it in gold lettering with the blue background. And the gold lettering in the back, uh, uh, the blue, Remember what Homer said, just bring people through the blue light tunnel, there's something with that blue? When she came to full awareness, it was the blue. And here's something else that was kind of funny. 
before she died, it's like, well, Judy, you know, since you're on your way out, I got a question to ask you, so when you get to the other side, you can answer me, okay? Yeah, okay, what? <laughs> you know, this is the kind of relationship they had. I said, well, I had this experience one time, and I really got the feeling that never go to the white light. Go to the blue light. And she goes, well, why do you say that? And I said, well, because I was in this experience, and, and I was being shown that you, that you go to the white light. So... They said, just follow it. Just go along with us on this. And I went, okay. So I'm going, and I'm following the white light and white light and white light. Next thing you know, I'm a baby being born into the glaring light of a doctor's office, and I'm being born again. And I went, I don't want to go to that white light. <laughs> That's not where I want to go. <laughs> and so I thought, well, Judy, you know you're going to be on the other side. So do you go to the blue, or are you going to go to the white light, and you just recycle back into here? I don't want to recycle back into here. <laughs> when I was on the other side with her, we knew you go to the love. And that love, that vibration is the blue. You go to the love. You go to source. Whatever it is you do, you just start heading to source. And you just let go of all the beliefs, and you know that there's just going to be beings there that are for you. But it, you get caught up in your own mental constructs, and that was her awareness. That's why she destroyed her altar. And I can tell you, we were, we, I recorded it. When I came out of this experience at exactly 6.05 in the morning, <laughs> I said, Gary, hurry up, come over here. I have to tell you what just happened, because otherwise when I'm in trance, it's like a dream. If you don't tell it right away, you're going to forget it. So I start telling him the story, and he goes, Ellie, don't you think you should record this? Yes, tech geek that I am, grab my computer, record. I knew exactly what program to open up, and then I was able to record it. I have it, the original experience recorded. It took 20 minutes to record it. They played the entire thing at her memorial service. They made two, Wayne made 200 copies in English of the I Am Love poem. We sent it off to Costco and just got JPEGs, you know, so you could do a photo. He made a hundred of them in the Chinese, gifted them out. He, um, he handed out the candles. I never finished telling you what else to have on the altar. So the other thing that she said to have on the altar was the I Am Love poem. If somebody dies, please take a picture of them and put them beside the I Am Love poem. Have a candle. This is actually the original candle that was gifted to me at the memorial service that I put with that, that I have. When I got to the memorial service, I didn't know I was going to be going to that, Wayne gifted me, and he gifted everybody at the memorial service, gold frames with the I Am Love poem in it. They went all over the Los Angeles area to buy up gold frames. Because Judy had shown to have the poem with the gold lettering, the blue background, and put it in a gold frame. And that's why I brought a frame app, thank you Apple, and that's why on these cards it has it with the blue, with the glow in between, the gold lettering, and the gold frame. That's why. On the back, we wanted people to be able to have the story. So gotprint.com, for those of you who do not know about gotprint.com and you have to have a printing solution done, it is your, it is your friend. They did these beautiful copies. This is a picture that Wayne sent me so that we could both be on there. And the story is not done. <sighs> Two days after Mindrel died, I'm back home in Tucson, or I, I'm at home in Tucson, and all of a sudden my teeth start chattering really strongly. I went, whoop, somebody's here. OK, let me finish supper. Let me finish what I'm doing. I finally am able to sit down and kind of sink in. And the minute I sink in, OK, is it Douglas? OK, Douglas, don't be startled here, OK? <laughs> so as soon as I sit down and sink in, Ellie, it was like this, this far from my face in this little Chinese voice, Ellie. <laughs> it's like, back off, girlfriend. I get you. <laughs> OK, hello, honey. How are you? <laughs> I want you to have the I Am Love poem translated into all the world's languages. It is the universal teaching. OK, I'll tell Wayne. I want you to go to Asia, 
I want you to teach my Asian students what you have learned here. I said, you better talk to your husband about that. He would have to finance it and figure out how that's all going to happen. Hi there, how are you? Anyway, I, um, I thought, well, okay. So I call Wayne up and I said, Judy just checked in. She is still pretty mad. <laughs> she made a commitment to go back to where she thought enlightenment was, that place with all those statues of people who are asleep, like the Christian version of it that Bob Monroe wrote about. She's there using her sawzall, <laughs> waking people up. And I saw later on, about a month, two months later, I've seen sections of it now that is starting to get cleared away. She has made a commitment to people who hear this story, call on me, I will help you get through the shadow lands of your mind. Call on me, I will help you. She told her family, I will be there, just like how Ellie helping me through the shadow lands, I will help you through the shadow lands. It was like, awesome. It turns out I was able to go to her memorial service. I didn't know that I was going to be able to go because I was supposed to be teaching a workshop <laughs> that weekend. It was, I was able to make arrangements that I was able to be there. I didn't know Wayne wanted me to sit right beside him. Otherwise, for her whole memorial service, he would have just been sitting up telling the story at the, at the front. So I was able to just give him some love and give him support while he was doing it and telling the story. We were able to read I Am Love in English, and then he read it in Chinese. We made the announcement that Judy showed up. She wanted it translated into all the world's languages. Within 27 hours of the memorial service ending, we got our first translation in Hebrew. Within 30 days, we have 30 translations. I have not even had time with my insane year this year, my busy year, to get them all up on the website. Because I want to get them formatted so that they have the JPEG that people in other countries can take the JPEG, they can go to a Photoshop and they can, you know, just a, a, and have it, have it made in their own language. The reason that we got so many languages is because one of the women who was at the memorial service came up to me and she said, Ellie, I want to thank you for helping when my mother died. You were, I was working with you and you were assessing her just before she left and your messages through, through her crossing o over and then on the other side were really helpful to the family. She happened to have a best friend who worked on an international cruise line all through Northeast <clears throat> Europe and I mean, we have it like in weird languages like Croatian and Hungarian. <clears throat> a couple versions of it in Spanish. Romanian. I mean, we have it in these really bizarre languages because the young man who was working on the cruise ship, he was his, Mr. Friendly. And so he would have a copies of them in his pocket or in his, pan, in his, in his whatever thing that he would carry around. And he would, he would say, you know, just make a really sweet connection with somebody. He didn't give them to everybody, but when he made a really sweet connection with somebody, here, I've got something to share with you. What do you think of this? Oh, and it would be so meaningful to people. I would like to have a copy of that. Well, do you think you could translate it for me? <laughs> so all over the cruise ships, he is still gathering languages from people on the cruise ship and sending them to me. Within six weeks of the memorial service, Wayne went to China. He set it up for me to go teach the first I Am Love retreat in Wutaishan Mountain, which is their sacred mountains in China. It's about a five-hour trip outside of Beijing. Off I go. Before I left, and when I was at Wayne's house, the night that I, I don't know when it was, I think it was the memorial service or something, I get the message in the shower from their Indian guru. Because so here, Mindrel had told me, I want you to go to Asia to teach my students. Well, you better talk to Wayne about that. He's got to finance it, set it up. 
After the memorial service, I was told, bring three extra sets of really nice clothing. You're going to do teaching. Wayne set it up, and his house was filled with people for, for me doing teaching, three different sessions. So instead of teaching the few people that were signed up at my workshop, because my marketing person kind of wigged out on me this spring, that's why I was able to go to the memorial service, I taught 100 people about the I Am Love story instead of a few people. And so it just always works out. You have to just trust how it always works out. So I'm in the shower one of these nights, and in the shower, the Indian guru shows up. All of a sudden, whoom, I'm, in, I'm in trance. Well, because her body was still at the house, they didn't have the heater on. And I kept thinking, gosh, I hope, you know, as I'm going into trance, all I'm, the last thought I'm having as I'm going into trance in the shower is, I hope the hot water doesn't run out. <laughs> 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 and so I'm talking to Swamiji. And Swamiji said, you will go to Asia, and you will tell the story. And I said, I push back. I always push back at spirit. Swamiji, if I'm going to Asia, because I know what it's like. When I go to Asia, it's like a 24-hour trip. Swamiji, if I'm going to Asia, I want first-class tickets to go there. And he laughed and laughed and laughed, because if I'm going to go teach, I don't want to be exhausted when I get there. If I'm going to teach, I want to be able to be spot on and be ready for the people. I don't want to be tired. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And in this Indian voice, I hear, I completely understand. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he also said, and you will provide darshan for the people. Now, I don't know what darshan is. So I come out of trance. I get dressed as enough as I can get dressed. And I go, Wayne? <laughs> They have the, a house that has steps that halfway up and halfway up, and I, I'm sitting across looking through the railing at him, and I said, Wayne, what's Darshan? And he starts explaining to me that it's a, I don't know, like some kind of a blessing, being in your presence, uh, a blessing or something like that. And he goes, Ellie, why are you asking me about Darshan? Well, Swamiji showed up for me in the shower telling me that I was going to provide blessing with people by sharing the story. And... You know, just these words and this stuff happening through the, that I don't even know about has been happening. I did teach in August. When I got done teaching, uh, Wayne wanted to make sure that four core people in that region were there who were at that workshop. By the time we got done doing that workshop, none of these people knew me. So we set up the workshop flyer that Wayne would be doing sharing and Ellie Drew would be doing sharing. As I'm starting to do the sharing and the teaching, they just told Wayne, and he, Wayne ended up being my translator for this, of course. They just told Wayne, Wayne, if Ellie's not around, you can do sharing. We were supposed to be do, doing touring of the five sacred peaks that all represented wind, fire, um, earth, ether, I don't know, what, whatever the five are. They did not even want to do the tours. They didn't want to do the sacred tours. We only want teaching from Ellie. They would ask questions, I would go in, I would get information, I would give it to them. They didn't even want to let me go to bed at night. If, if, during dinner, they would ask questions. During um, the five-hour bus ride, they wanted to have teaching all the way on the five-hour bus ride going back. And I said, the only way I'm going to do teaching on the way home on the bus ride is if you guys give me evaluations. And so, in these beautiful, I mean, I could frame them. They're so beautiful. Chinese writing is so beautiful. I have this Chinese writing that is so beautiful with their evaluations. And one of the people, two of the people didn't get their evaluations done. And they said, well, we'll just send them to you. And it's like, yeah, I know how that happens. Not, doesn't happen. Okay, so I just kick my feet up. I go, when your evaluations are done, I will do teaching. I will rest right now. <laughs> so they were like, hey, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, get your evaluations done. And, and then they were able to ask questions again and, and have clarity. And some interesting things happened when I was there about um, just some things that I was able to see. Like I saw this, it was like a web that was foggy and it was really sticky. And it was the cultural and religious and family in indoctrination that people get. 
And so really I saw that's part of your enlightenment is when you're, when you're trying to go to your next level, getting out of that is, it's hard, it's sticky, it holds you back, it wants to, your beliefs are so strong. I mean, the beliefs and the mind is so strong. Now, I don't know, I'm hoping this doesn't offend anybody when I say this, although I've probably said a few things that have probably offended some of you, so my apologies. So one of the things that, that one of the people nearly passed out on, I mean literally nearly passed out on, when I said that the um, Bodhisattva prayer was probably one of the most evil things on the planet. And one of the women, like, she was behind the couch, and she just dropped to her knees and turned sheet white, and I'm like fanning her. <laughs> saying, you, so the bodhisattva vow is when you make a vow to come back here for every lifetime until every sentient being reaches enlightenment. The reason that this is so bad, you do not want to make these kind of vows, is because when you make these kind of vows, you are compelling yourself through your own energetic ties. The mind is so strong that if you happen to be in a really strong ecstasy religious state and you make this kind of vow, you are imploring your, and compelling yourself, forcing yourself back into the cycle of reincarnation here. Why not just not do that and say, yeah, I want to go back in. You guys want to go back in? Yeah, let's go back in and have an experience while you're here. Do it because you want to do it but not because you're being compelled to do it. Do you see? So by the time we got for these people to releasing vows and promises that no longer serve you, it had all been translated into Chinese. They were all standing up. And I said, okay, the first time was probably going to be a, a good run through, you know, to see how it is. It was not a run through at all. They were so firm in their power. They were so firm in their commitment to release vows and promises that no longer serve them. They, they wanted to clear the slate for themselves, and they yelled the releasing vows and promises statements. And at the end, it says, I command it, I demand it. I claim freedom now. And now they'd been doing so much work with me. Shenzai! And all of them are yelling now is Shenzai, Shenzai. <laughs> and then doing the breath work and that room reverberated with just this explosion of energy that got released out of them for 10 minutes. We were just shaking. It was so powerful. So be careful the vows and promises you make, especially when you're highly emotional. Be really respectful when somebody is crossing over. And yes, it's really hard. Yes, you have to deal with your grief. There's tools to deal with the emotional body. It's free on my website, the emotional unhooking process. You go to elliedrew.com. You go to free. I've got a big button this big on my website that's called free. And, you know, go and get the, um, the core practices for the releasing vow, vow statements, the, some of the manifesting statements. The second one is the emotional unhooking process. Get it for free. Do the breath work. Reset your systems. Okay, so now I want to just see if anybody's got any questions about my experience with Judy, and I will repeat the questions. Okay, yes? How do you define ultimate uh, consciousness? How do, you fought, how do you define ultimate consciousness? Just kind of that ultimate, oh, she was just, she was out of the illusion of the mental construct. So he said, how, do you, how did she reach, or how would you define ultimate consciousness? She was no longer in the mental construct. She had broken out of the belief systems that she had, that she had to reach some particular place, that she had to be some particular way. All of that dropped away, and she just came to that beautiful, pure place of love. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Question? Yes? What was her form at that point? What was her form at that point? Uh, the question, what was her form at that point? The soul has three aspects. It has the aspect that travels in the body when you're here. It has the aspect that can travel and make connections to get you to this event or to get you to this talk or to get you to, you know, wherever it needs you to get to or connect you up with other people. And then it has the ultimate observer aspect. 
even as I was traveling with her, I was able to still have the ultimate observer watching the, the whole thing happen. And I call them inner journey bodies. I don't know what it is. It's almost like um, the soul knows how to um, make an imprint of this form that you're familiar with and you're comfortable with. And so it was like I was seeing her like, uh, like, like through gauze, you know, like through a shadow. Like, I don't know, how do I, I don't know how to explain it. But it wasn't that she was locked to form at that point. She knew that it was only, form was only a tool. And when you learn how to do inner journal, journey travels, there comes a place where you're no form at all. No form at all. I mean, I have a story I could tell you about that, how I, how I had that experience. Okay. So, um, any other questions? Yes? Is there anything any of us can do to go to all those places where people of all kinds of religious backward, backgrounds are locked in that state where she found herself, where they thought they were where they were supposed to be and they weren't? Is there anything we can do to reduce those people? <coughs> okay, so did everybody hear the question? What can, what can all of us do, or what can any of us do to do what Judy's doing now, what Mindra's doing, to help release people who are in locked areas? I don't know. Let me go ask. Un momento. Um, there's a variety of things that I was just kind of downloaded and shown. Um, first of all, um, a few years ago, I did sacred forgiveness ceremony here. Really a big deal. A big, big, big deal. Sometimes when I'm doing readings for somebody, and somebody's doing uh, the sacred forgiveness ceremony, or they're doing the Way of the Lotus Flower practice, what I say is invite in your ancestors to do the practice with you. Invite in those who are unseen to you or those who feel stuck or those who are stuck in their own. They know they're stuck. Absolutely know they're stuck. They know they're stuck. Invite them in to do it with you. So if you, like when I say to do the way of the lotus flower practice for 21 days, it's a beautiful thing for you to just do it for a week just for yourself, just to kind of get into the rhythm of it so that you're comfortable with it and you know kind of what's your stuff. And then start inviting those in that are ancestors, those who are unseen to you, but are present. You know, it was, it was actually doing the reading that I did for Dean uh, quite some time ago when it was one of his brothers that came into the sacred forgiveness ceremony that I had done for the family who said, thank you for doing it. Thank you for doing that. Can you please in, have, when you do sacred forgiveness ceremony, I was with my family that night, and it helped me. And then this big, bright being showed up in the reading that I was giving Dean. And I do have permission to say his name and all of that. So <laughs> anyway, they said, bring in, invite people in. I was just crying in that reading because, you know, we're so concerned about us right here in this mundane world. We're, we don't think that people right on the other side need some help also to transition. And I can tell you that oftentimes when I'm teaching, I have more spirit attendance than I have physical attendance. When I do sacred forgiveness ceremony, guaranteed, there's always way more people in the spirit world than in the physical world that are doing sacred forgiveness ceremony. His brother is on the other side with that big bright being, and they are gathering people up that when I do ceremony, they are there. When I went back to, um, I do a retreat down in um, Alabama, at uh, Sky Island in Alabama. And when I went back this last spring, there were people that were already there waiting, had been gathering together from the time I was there the year before. I'm only one person, people. 
all of you can be healers for people. All of you can take this simple practice. I have it all written out. Invite these. You guys know how to go into an altered state because you're dowsers. You have to know how to go into an altered state because you're dowsers. Go into that beautiful altered state in a, in a sincere heart. Invite others in and literally do it as a service to those on the other side. That's the really a beautiful gift you can do. The way of the lotus flower practice, do it with babies who are coming in. Oh, you think you're coming into this family? Let's do some work first before you get in here. Okay, let's clear you out. Clear off that soul field. Clear out some of that memory field that I talked about. For those of you who missed my talk, my first talk this morning, make sure you buy that because it talks about the soul field, the memory field. It's that aspect of us that's that observer that's recording all of your experience. And then when you go into another lifetime, remember you're getting recorded the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so you want to be able to clear those memories when you're coming back into another lifetime so you're not repeating patterns over and over again that I see show up over and over again when I'm doing sessions with people. So that was a really great question. Thank you for asking that. All right. Anyone else? Yes? I have a question. My niece passed away about five years ago. And when you said about the hooks, it brought on my brother and my sister-in-law talk about her like she's still there. Oh, yeah. I mean, they go to the cemetery twice yeah. a week. Mm -hmm. uh, she's the main conversation of each dinner table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the they need some counseling. Away yet. Mm -hmm. Golden. Big golden I mean, he hooks. Spent mm -hmm. one hundred and ten thousand dollars for a mausoleum. a mausoleum just for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what she's saying is that she has family that hasn't been able to let go, and it's really hard to see that. But what they end up doing is they probably end up getting really bad lung problems also because grief is in the lungs. And um, a lot of times people will um, get asthma and other kinds of complications. Well, passed away, they're both going downhill physically. Yeah, because they can't let go. Um, the other thing uh, I was shown, this is, I'm glad you brought this up because this is actually really important for many of you. I, I was doing one of my retreats and a woman was having a situation like this that she, so a friend had died or a family member had died and she just felt like she was torn. So I went in and I said, you know, well, what kind of information can I give this person? What I was shown is a sheet of paper with two people, one on each side. And what I was shown is that when you have relationships with people, you're putting hooks into each other. This person's putting hooks into this person. This person's putting hooks into this person. So unexpectedly or whatever, when a person dies and you tear that sheet of paper, one of the, you feel torn. Uh, here, let me, I got paper here. Sorry for those of you who are for, for doing, you know, your video on this, but all right. So here's your sheet of paper. One person on this side. One person on this side. You create hooks that go between you. Some of them come from this person to that person. Some come from this person to, to this person. And when you tear the paper, these hooks is what you're feeling. So they feel like they're literally torn. Energetically, it would be really great for them to go to some healers because energetically, you, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so anyway, this is just information so you can use the information. So when you see these hooks that are here, you feel torn so that when this, pers when this person moves out of their physical body, uh, anyway, if I tore it, and they move into their physical body here. Their spirit body is still there. But you're still feel on this side, you're still feeling those tears. So I asked the spirits, I said, well, what can people do? When you go into trance, you're out of space time. You're into no time. What I was shown is go into trance, visualize both people still being alive. I, I don't have a good marker here. Visualize both people still being alive and unhook your hook that they have into you and hand them back. Take their hooks that you have into them, take them back. So that when you tear here now, between here, this person is whole, 
and this person is whole, both sides. And you don't feel that burning gnawing. And so immediately as I was talking to this woman, I said, okay, so go in. She goes, well, now? Is there any better time? <laughs> like, yeah, go in. Close your eyes, go in. Just imagine this piece of paper and just do it. And sh she was like, oh my God, I see hooks. <laughs> it's like, take yours out that belong to her, hand them back, take, you, you, take them back, separate it out, make sure it's not clean, now come back into present time. And she's like, oh, I just, wow, I feel better. <laughs> she felt a lot better. So anybody that you have that's going to be crossing over, unhook. I can even tell you that when you're going to sell your home, unhook. <laughs> when you're going to have an ending of a relationship, unhook from both sides. Yes? How do you get hooked? How do you get hooked? Uh, the question is, how do you get hooked? You just get hooked because you're in relationship with people. You get emotional attachments, and you don't mean to make them, but we like, we're, we all, we're kind of, we're like, like a big puppy pile, you know? <laughs> Think, I can park into the North 40 with my new car, and you can bet I can come out, and there's going to be five cars parked around me. You know, we just are natural clumpers, right? So it's the same emotionally. We like to clump. We like to connect with people. But when somebody's getting ready to cross, unhook, so that you can still be whole and healthy with the other person, but you don't feel like you're torn. Yes? Survivor's guilt, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And since, since she has passed, um, is there any way I can help her get unhook her from uh, the connection mm -hmm. with her mm -hmm. children, long gone children? And like, as a third person, instead of me unhooking. Right. I can tell you, again, that oftentimes when I'm giving presentations, I oftentimes have more spirit attendance than I do physical attendance. Invite your people into talks like this. Because once they figure it out and they have the information, they just do it. Yeah, they get it. Um, also, again, when you do the Way of the Lotus Flower practice, invite her in. You know, a lot of the healing that doesn't happen and a lot of the damage that we have, we get because we don't know who we are. We don't know we're a soul having a physical experience. We might get it intellectually, but when life is really happening in the midst of pain and suffering and death and life and all of that, when you've got a loved one who's right there and who's dying, the bodysuit, what, what, is, what, is, what is its prime directive? Say it again. Survival. Say it again. Survival. So what's it going to do when it's on its deathbed? Fight. It's going to try to fight and survive. And so it's natural that it's going to do that. And the people and the loved ones who are there, it's natural for them to want to hold back and to hold them back. It's a natural instinct to do that. And so it's about knowing who you are at another level. If you can't do it with, for yourself in those moments, you know, don't beat yourself up too much about it. Give yourself some time. But it's the thing about holding on for years and years. And, you know, it's just, it's really not healthy. Um, I was told in my Taoist training that in China, they've recognized the damage that it does to the organs so much that if they have somebody who's had a loss, they'll say, okay, we'll let you cry and suffer and bang the table and curse and, you know, be really upset about it and sob and sob and sob for three days. And then after that, snap out of it. <laughs> snap out of it. You pull yourself out of that emotional thing. And it still is hard, especially if you've lost a child. You know, it's still really hard. You still have to live with it. Use that emotional unhooking process. The emotional unhooking process is such a gift to us. It's, a, it's free on my website. It's because I saw these hooks. It's because I saw and realized how to 
that, you, that the emotional body doesn't hear you unless you do a reset with the breath. If you just think it intellectually, you can think it until you're blue in the face that you don't want to suffer and grieve anymore. But until you do the reset and acknowledge that into your body with the breath, it doesn't get it. So when you're too close to the situation with death, particularly with death, when you're too close to the situation, you can't think straight. You're too close to it. When you do the emotional unhooking process, what you're doing, the need of the emotional mind is to be acknowledged. So when you acknowledge I'm suffering. I hate it. I, I love you and I hate you that you died and left me behind. I, you know, it's, you'll recognize it because it's not logical. It's emotional. And so if you can acknowledge that body, mind, and emotion, we got to have a talk. All of this pain and suffering I'm feeling in my body because I have had a loss and I don't want to let go of this loss. I, I deeply and completely accept myself without judgment for having it, but it's not helping me to survive better. Remember, it's all about survival. It's not helping me to survive better when you hold this kind of grief. I need you to let it go. So I command and demand to keep the wisdom I have gained, release all pain patterns, perceptions, and memories out of my system now. For those of you who did that work with me, that's an example of how you can do it. What happens when you do the breath work and reset is that you pop out of the audience. You pop out of the movie screen and back into the audience. So it doesn't change if somebody has died or is going to die. But what happens is that it gives you some perspective. You're not so locked up into your emotional body. Remember, it's, it's your vehicle. It's just a body. You're going to pop out of it, and you have some perspective, and you can make better decisions. And yes, it's still going to hurt. So my yeah. question is, can I do it to my brother and sister? <laughs> there is no savior, honey. She wants to know if she can do it for her brother and sister. You can do the emotional unhooking with them if they're open to that, but you said they're not open to that. You can't do somebody else's work for them. There's no saviors, people. You have to do your own work. You create your own karma. You create your own freedom. There is no saviors. There is no enlightenment. You are love. When you pop out and you get out of all your belief systems, you're going to go, oh, my God, I'm love. What did I make it so hard for? <sighs> it's so easy. And we try to just make it so hard. It's not hard. So don't make it hard. And I know you guys are, have to pee, and you're hungry, <laughs> and you're tired, and you want to hear more for another hour, and we're going to go home now. So I would thank you so much. This is your lessons for tonight. Thank you for letting me share this. Oh, before you go, I have a couple of announcements. All right, you can hear me. All right, one, I brought...